All right, everybody. Thank you for your patience uh, while uh, our designer got logged into the meeting. And I uh, want to thank everybody for making time. I want to, it's obviously a very busy week for everybody, so we appreciate that. But we wanted to get, try to sneak one more meeting in here before the holidays so that um, give you an opportunity to speak directly to the designer, uh, Kevin from Castle Booz Associates. Is that what it yes. Is? And uh, Ke so, Kevin, I'll, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. We'll, you can uh, fill us in on what you've been working on uh, up until this point. Tell them a little bit about your firm and the type of works that you do, and uh, you know, we'll get right into it. And if anybody has any questions along the way, by all means, just uh, jump right in. Okay. Thank you. Um, as you said, my name is Kevin Witzel. I'm the project manager and associate with Castle Blues Associates. We're the architects for the feasibility study for the, fire, for the new police station. Um, to date, or give you a little bit of a history with Castle Blues, we've been around for about 45 years. I myself have been with the company for almost 23 years, and I, oh, and I specialize in um, public safety. Castle Blues does nothing but public work. We specialize in, I'm with the group that does uh, public safety. The other part of our office does uh, public schools, K through 12, uh, and charter schools. Um, that being said, we we're a, st a staff of about 75 or 80 people now. We're still growing. Uh, we have three offices, one in, um, in Foxborough, Mass., one in downtown Boston, and one in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, with the main business office being in Connecticut. Um, but the public safety group is really centered in the Foxborough office, um, headed up by my boss, Todd Costa. He was going to try and jump on the call, but I'm not sure if he's going to make it or not. He had another little scheduling conflict. We had lost power in our in the Foxborough office until yesterday afternoon, so we're running a little scattered trying to get things to finish, uh, up to speed. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, what we've done so far with the chief and some others of his command staff and the town administrator and an overview is we reviewed uh, three different building sites um, around town. Uh, we started off with um, investigating the site that's over adjacent to the high school. Uh, we went through that, we looked through it. Um, I can pull up the, it might be just as easy for me to pull it up and show you what our evaluation was. Well, actually, I should step back. We first started off by doing a um, space needs program with the, de with the department to figure out exactly what they need for their building, what, depart what divisions they have, um, how many people, how many vehicles, how much space they need, storage, detention, whether they wanted a uh, meeting room, whether it was going to function as an EOC. With that effort, we came up with a what's called a program for the building. It gives us a square footage. We start off with um, a net square footage. We put a net to gross ratio to it, and that's the number that we try and design our, our floor plans to. So we figured out that we needed approximately 35,000 square feet for a building to meet the programmatic needs of the, of the department now and going into the future. We try and look out, forecast as much as we can uh, with populations of the, of the municipality, what their current staffing levels are, if, they, if it seems like they're right online, or if there's a chance for the, the municipality to grow population-wise, which would mean the station would need, the department would need to grow to meet the needs of a bigger community. Um, we've done that process. We're approximately, I think, 35,000 square foot for the overall building size. Um, How does from, that compare to, to today's police station, is it? I think you're about 26,000. Not efficiently laid out. Um, kind of, the current facility is, besides everybody here probably knows how uh, rough conditions the physical building is. Um, kind of the layout and what we try and look at as you'll see as we go through the process we try and segregate the populations and people that are going to be in the building you've got your public that's going to be coming in to interface with the department you're going to have the department where they're going to need their secure areas can i just ask you to speak up a little bit oh. i know we got that uh, uh a little extra outside there I just no i don't think so but uh, I just want to make sure everybody can hear hear clearly. Yep. So if you could just work raise your voice a little bit. Yep. Um, so <clears throat> so the existing building is really 
um, pretty cut up. And the, one of the big things that we see in, in public safety design, especially police stations, is we need to segregate the populations of types of people that are going to be in the building. You've got your general public that's going to be coming for an interface with the department, so we need a friendly, inviting uh, lobby in a space that they can conduct their business in a private manner so that they're not broadcasting it to anybody else in the lobby. So typically we'll set up some sort of an interview room or a room that we can bring uh, the public into. Next we've got the, 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 the department's use and that's we try to segregate that into a couple of different categories where you've got the patrol officers that don't have any real business with the administrative area in a lot of departments we've starting to kind of keep the patrol area in one one floor and put the um, administration on another that's kind of the approach working with chief brown is what we started with with this project and then you've got the um, the third population primarily in the building would be the detainees you don't ever want the detainees to be coming out through the public access or into the actual building for the department so we set up man traps and we control the access for how an individual is brought into the building, keeping in mind always the safety of an officer as they're processing a prisoner and then the prisoner's well-being while they're under the custodial care of the department. When we release that individual, we also want to make sure that they're not going out through the public or through the PD's um, work area. So we try and set it up so that there's a, um, a release door that also doesn't put them into a parking lot where the department is going to have their vehicles, their personal and the staff in the department's vehicles, cruisers. So there's a lot of moving parts in segregation of the populations within the building. We've already gone through that stage. We've started a very preliminary conceptual layout where we've got some spaces in a basement. We've got the primarily patrol sitting on the first floor with the administration and dispatch on the second floor. There was also a desire from the chief to break dispatch away from being the primary interface with the public. It's a very stressful job. It's a very um, focused job. That to have them have to deal with the public at, a, at the front front window is very distracting to the dis dispatchers. And it's a ten it's a trend that we're seeing more and more in modern policing. That the dispatch is more of it used to be your officers would rotate through as your dispatchers. We're seeing now dispatchers are becoming more and more a professional group of dedicated individuals that do nothing but dispatch. So we're looking to try and take those dispatchers, kind of pull them away from the patrol, because in the old days, the dispatch room was always kind of the, the, the hangout room. Guys would go in, the officers would go in there for have their, their meals or writing their reports or just to hang out with the dispatchers. We're trying to break that culture where it's really a professional group. We're trying to provide, typically we're providing spaces that are tailored for the use for what the officers need it for. So we'll have a separate area for um, report writing and for, um, for evidence, for uh, break rooms, locker rooms. Uh, we even sp started speaking about the need to have gender, gender neutral locker rooms and facilities within the department. That's a, um, a trend that's coming along um, and the plumbing code is starting to address, going to start to address that. From what I understand in the next round of the building code, there's going to be provisions in there for general neutral uh, toilet and shower facilities. Um, so we're always looking ahead to try and make sure that what we're putting in now is going to work for the department future years down the road. We try and look uh, 20, 25 years down the road, but build a building that's 50 years so that you have a building that the maintenance is, is minimal on the exterior as well as interior. Um, I should have noted when we started off at KBA, we also have um, interior designers. Our interior designers work with us even at this conceptual day, stage and was actually with us when we did the programming to make sure that as we're designing spaces, we're designing materials that are going to be, uh, I don't want to say bulletproof or um, indestructible, but things that are going to have a very long lifespan with a very minimal maintenance required to it. In the old days, we would have used uh, vinyl, composition vinyl composition tiles, which are, you, know, you need to strip it, you need to put new co coats on it. If anybody's ever done old school work, now we're doing more rubbers, which are wet mopped and buffed. There's no real harsh chemicals. It's all environmentally friendly. Um, so we've gone 
to the point where we've got the program. We started to put together some very conceptual floor plans to start to put a little three-dimensional or two-dimensional view to what that looks like. And then we started to review the sites that we had um, were given to us. Um, first site that we looked at was over in Vinebrook, the Vinebrook site that was city-owned or town-owned. Uh, we rapidly found that that had a significant amount of wetlands that we weren't going to be able to deal with and there wasn't really going to be enough room to really put a new station on from the square footage that we needed for the site. Then we looked, o then we looked over at the site over off the access road to the high school. Again, that had a lot of challenges. There was some wetlands in there. The biggest, some of the biggest, cha that was our biggest challenge. How do we get a roadway in and, a si and access to and from that site. Um, one of the challenges that we looked at was that it, um, um, I don't know if, whoops, I'm going to share my screen. Went to the trouble to get me on the, the site and now I'm not sharing. <laughs> Problem, the one over by the high school was that um, to have a second means of egress. Well, we, one of the primary things in public safety is you want to have a way for the department to get in and out, multiple ways for the department to get in and out from the station. Um, if somebody would have happened to block the main entrance, the only entrance, then they have no way of getting reinforced people back to the station or from the station out to an event. Um, so we like to have two separate uh, remote locations for officers to be able to respond back and forth to. It's not letting me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a technology guy, I'm an architect. <laughs> um, yeah, they hit Sharon, that one came up. So, do I have to click that? onto that screen. There we go. Um, so as you can see on, on the site for the, for the high school, we were looking to put a um, driveway in for the public in the primary ex entrance and exit for the, for the PD, where the front entrance would be on the front of the building. Um, and then we ran into a problem of needing to use a, create a access road to the, to use, utilize the school property on the adjacent property as an emergency secondary egress for the department to come and go from. 
um, with the problems with the, with the wetlands and lack of visibility and lack of access, we didn't feel that that was an appropriate location. Um, so we ended up going to look at the, the existing building once we got rid of the Vinebrook and the one at the height, once we determined that neither of the f other sites were um, viable for a new public safety for a lot of different reasons from a spatially uh, space utilization standpoint, we started looking at the existing, s the existing PD site. Um, there was a talk of whether we try to uh, preserve the building, whether we try to um, build the new building, um, then tear down the existing and then finish the rest of the building. We decided to go over a bunch of different concepts and we figured we'd start, the, the thing that made the most sense was, let's take a look at if the building was not there and we had free run of the existing, excuse me, the existing site. Um, pros, one of the cons to that is the department would have to move out of this current location for approximately two years while the construction of the new uh, building was done. Um, but it allowed us to utilize the site in, to its maximum potential. We thought we would come off the, the main street um, as far away from the main intersection as possible. So we'd come in, the public would come in in this location here, have this front part as their parking area and access. The, depart the department, on the other hand, would come in on the far end We'd have access control with a gate to allow them to get to the back back of house, if, as we call it, where that would be the secure parking for all of the the department's cruisers and the officers' personal vehicles, and it would be completely fenced in, privacy screens on the the chain link fencing, so that we would be able to have a secure um, perimeter for the for the department, while still allowing the the um, the public to get to the building. We thought that the one op, another op, another feature that we were looking to do is to give them two ways out, as I talked about earlier. So not only can they come in this way, we were going to have another gated entrance down to the lower part of the site in this area here, where in an emergency situation, the cruisers would have a long-range RFID uh, card reader that would open the gate so that they could get out and get back out onto the to the road and respond to an incident. Um, that's where we are for um, kind of a site analysis. We then started to work with a footprint to um, to work out some organization of how the building might lay out. Where in the lower level here, I'll zoom in because some of the text gets a little small. Um, yeah, ask a question on that design. You, you, you functioning from the concept that the existing building would be leveled. Correct. So there's nothing that, that will remain nope. in the facility. Correct. So, no, we realize that there is, the building is on the historic register, which is another, I don't want to say hurdle, but another um, box that we have to check off if that's a direction we do want to go on. Um, I'm not, I don't, we haven't really engaged the historic district yet to know what their, um, how sacred of a building it is. Um, architecturally, it looks like there's a lot of the historic features might have already been gone. We've got vinyl siding on it. We've got replacement windows. Um, the historic, it seems the not being a historic preservationist, I probably shouldn't put my bias to it, but it, the building doesn't know this. It, it's more of a historic for what it used to be, not what it currently is and what it's going to be in the future. Um, that's so, so that, that so when you remove the existing building, yep. is there a mitigation plan in terms of dealing with the aquifer, the water level up in the area, because there's a significant uh, issue with that, and that's yeah. probably a major concern with the black mold in the building. Yeah, that, um, that's something that we would look into as we start further down the road. If, if, if the desire of this this committee is that that's the route that we want to go that this is the right site this is the right approach that we tear down and build new then we would enter into we get into the subsurface investigation to find out exactly what the water table is where it is what kind of um, geotechnical 
information we can gather so that we can start to influence what kind of foundations, whether we can really, whether it's smart to put a basement in or not, depending on what all of that information gets. But that's kind of on the next level of um, kind of scrap, I don't bad analogy, but scratching the surface. Um, we're just kind of at this level, we need to get to a, some more information. That'll, that'll all be included in yes. the final design. Yes. Yeah, as part of our final report, um, as part of our final report, we'll, we typically will have the full evaluation of the site analysis that we've just go, we've gone through in a formal document. We'll have our program. We'll have um, floor conceptual floor plans, conceptual imagery of what the building's going to look like, along with a complete um, opinion of probable cost. So, when you're putting the design together for the building, as you have the layouts. Um, uh, do you do you try to build a facility so that there's shared space? You know what I'm saying. In other shared words, shared with the public or no, within within the building. In other words, if if you've got administrative offices and meeting rooms, uh, are those meeting rooms to handle other issues that that might be for investigations and so on and so forth? Yep. I mean, my feeling is that that. That becomes an issue down the road when you begin to have shared space. Mm -hmm. Who owns it? How are we going to use it? And, exactly. and I think in terms of having a design of the facility, you want to have it so that there are specific rooms, adequate rooms, to handle all of the operations of the facility so that there's not going to be an issue of booking space and not having the space and go, yeah. going through that issue. Yeah. If I understand you, we are going to make sure that if a say a conference or a meeting room has to have a specific purpose and that's the only purpose for it, then that's that's fine. But if it can be shared with other uses and be multiple use, we talked about um, with the chief about doing a um, community room in the front, which would be a main training room, so that not only can the department use it for their training, in-house training, but they can bring outside agencies in. Benefit to that, you bake it of a certain size as, your, as a host community or host facility, you get X number of free light, free seats at that seminar. So it's a bo it's a benefit to the department to be able to have training companies come in and conduct their training there for other other departments. That would be one component that would be on that training room. So that's sp police specific. It's also we typically locate those so that they can be accessed off the public lobby. So if there was like this group needed a meeting a meeting space to to meet in because this room was empty, I mean, was being used, or there was no place else for this meeting to take place, you could conduct the meeting in there. Um, we could also set up, we've set those up also as emergency operations centers. I understand that's over at the fire department currently, um, so we wouldn't necessarily have the full-blown capabilities in that, but if there's a, through the process, if we determine that there's a desire to have that as a backup location, we build in the infrastructure for that. And if there was a need for, if there was a desire to allow um, the Lions Club, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, whatever the civic agencies want to you rent the room out for their Pinewood Derbies or their cookie sales or whatever, there would still be the ability for that. See, the only thing I'd, I'd want to guide against, the, you know, looking at a, a, a blueprint of a facility is that when, when, and I've seen this happen particularly in schools where buildings have been built and then a couple of years down the road, you know, they move. Uh, they, have, they have to move a secretary into that space mm -hmm. because they need that secretary space, the current one, for something else. So I'm, I'm, I would just be cautious about mm -hmm. having a design where these things haven't ta been taken into consideration, so that there's more than adequate space. Because as you know, down the road, there's going to be more demands upon the department, and. Uh, you know, in terms of of uh, meeting space for community members, um, that's generally a secondary option. But that's also uh, an option that sometimes helps sway some support for the project. Yeah. But it's not just a police facility that nobody's ever going to go to unless they they need business with the department. It's kind of a this is a community. We can have meetings. We can have other groups. But to your point. When we did the programming effort with the department, we looked at what their current staffing is and what their projected is going to be as far out as we could possibly forecast. So to your point, if there's a, if we thought that the, talking with the chief and his, the command staff, if there was a potential for a department to start to expand, we put in an extra spot. If there was a possibility that there might be two administrative positions, 
we've got the space big enough so that we can put additional furniture desks in there to make this the, the revised plan work without having to really wholesale play the whole Rubik's Cube game of moving and putting people where they don't really belong. We've tried to future future proof as much as possible with where the current staffing is and where we see the staffing going in the future. Yeah, I think that I think the public has to understand too, and I think you know many people are becoming more aware of this that you know policing a generation ago was a lot different than policing today. Uh, you know, yet they still have to deal with the crucial issues during the day in terms of you know ensuring that there's safety and security within the communities. But you know, the there's more uh, a focus today being placed upon counseling, therapeutic approaches to dealing with social issues. Yep. And, and so, you know, it would be really wise to ensure that when the facilities is designed that there is adequate space for those kinds of things that do not take away from what the police department needs in terms of operations yeah. on, from the other end. Yeah. So that, that's the only thing. Yeah. I think um, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for all this. Just a quick question that came up. Yes. Can you speak a little bit to what you found on the condition of the existing building and uh, just to let us know what we're dealing with there and why um, a new building is probably the, the better way to go here? Um, condition of the building, um, I don't know if you guys have been through it. It's in pretty rough shape. Uh, there's leaks everywhere. Um, from a code standpoint, um, it's, a, it's, it's a category three type building, I believe where it's a critical use facility, which has higher uh, seismic uh, earthquake resistance, which there is none in that building currently, because um, we want that building to stand in any kind of natural, as, uh, resist as much natural disaster as possible, uh, as the code requires us to. Currently, the building doesn't, doesn't meet that. Um, the rubble stone foundation would be a major cost to try and reinforce. Um, is it impossible? No. Does it cost money? Yes. Um, it would probably be pretty close to building a new. Um, in an older structures like this where there is no provisions for just the seismic, that's a pretty hefty expense to, to renovate um, as opposed to build new. Um, that's only one component. Then you've got at the, si at the kind of complexity of the work that we'd be doing, we need to bring it up to energy code and all building code requirements. Uh, right now, I don't think there's any insulation in any walls. I think there's only minimal in an attic. In the attic, um, my I've actually just trying cons consolidating visits. I've got my engineer, my mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers coming out this afternoon, and we're going to start doing a thorough review of all of the building systems to get you an idea of what the deficiencies are on the electric service, what plumbing, mechanical, all of those, all of the systems in the building will be putting together a full report documenting whether we feel that what the systems are, what condition they're in, how, cl how close are they to the end of their useful life, and a recommendation to what, based on that, whether it's fix it or replace it. Um, and we'll go through that with every system, every component of the building. Um, from an, ac an accessibility standpoint, the elevator in there doesn't meet the current elevator code for being able to get a gurney in. So we know that we're immediately going to have to be doing something with an elevator. Um, I know that walking through this, the building as many times as I have, none of the stairs meet code. They're supposed to be in an enclosed, fire-rated enclosure to ensure the safety of the occupants as they're exiting a floor. They get into a rated stair enclosure, and they have, free, they have safe passage to an exterior door and out to the street. That currently doesn't exist in the building. Um, some, of the some of the detention areas where you've got the custodial responsibility to the detainees. I'm sure you probably haven't passed a, a DPH and inspection for years. Um, they always, there's, the, there's a lot of things that need to be upgraded. Almost every, everything in the building would need to be redone. So when you start looking at what's left, you may have some structure that's left. Vinyl siding, you could keep. <laughs> <laughs> if that would be. <laughs> Um, but I don't know how long ago that was okay. put on. But, but the 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 cost to to add rent to do a major renovation in a project of that si of of a building that scale, the cost differential really isn't a whole lot. And then you have the problem that 
the existing facility, the existing square footage or the existing configuration of the building may not lend itself to an efficient layout for spaces within the building. That you may have columns and walls that can't be moved that are inhibit the the development of the of the, pro, of the building so that it can be efficient. That means you got to how you need a bigger building for what you really need. Where when we're talking about new construction, we typically will try and get around 30 to 33 percent uh, efficiency factor from what the square footage that we say you need for say so you need a 125 square foot office for a typical office. Well, you really need to add 33 percent more because that doesn't include <coughs> excuse me your corridors, your bathrooms, kind of the things that aren't part of that space that's in that net to gross ratio. We've put those into the building where, although it says 35,000, I'd be willing to bet we could probably get the building down to probably, when we start to really fine tune it, probably in the 31, 32,000 square foot mark. So, to answer your question, the, there's a lot of expense to redo. Um, we haven't even talked about any kind of abatement. Um, I've got a abatement contract and consultant I'm going to have contact the chiefs to be able to come through and do an analysis of the building to see where we have um, materials. All of that will be put into our opinion of probable costs, uh, which we haven't gotten to talking about yet, but it's a good launching off point. Um, when we establish a cost for the project, we establish a total cost, which means not only the bricks and mortar, but everything that the way I, the analogy that I heard that I liked was if you take the building when it's finished and completed, you took it upside down and shook it out, all of that other stuff is called furniture, fixtures, and equipment. We put budgets in for all of that, computers, radios, um, your designers fees, you're going to need an OPM, an, an owner's project manager, moving costs, advertising for the bidding process. We, we really do a really thorough soup to nuts evaluation of any and all expenses because generally we have one shot at getting the number getting up getting the money so that number has to be legitimate it can't be overinflated because then people will realize you're just asking for way too much but the way we go through our um, opinion of probable costs it's very transparent on where the money is being spent and what it's in at this early stage a lot of the stuff is going to be based on square footages and allowances that we know that of building this size, we know that the security system is going to be X number of dollars per square foot. So we put those in. We know that the computers and radios and any of the IT we have, we've got kind of historical data on what we know that typically does. So we built that in. We put that into the number. We also put in some escalation to be to to hit where we think we're going to be going out to bid. So if this in an ideal world, this goes out to May. We need approximately 10 months to a year to do all the final, all the drawings, get it out to bid, get it awarded, so that a year from now, that's the price that we're looking for that's going to show up on an envelope on a bid process. That we want to make sure that that number fits in with where we're at, so we put in some escalation. We also know that some of the other equipment that's going in the building, the furniture, the chairs, the, op the, the tables and the, and the desks, those aren't going to be bought for probably another year after that, so we've got some escalation in those numbers so that we try our best to, to hit our targets to make sure that we never have to go back and get more money. Unless there's something catastrophic that changes in, in the, the mission of the department or something, I mean, even with COVID, we had a lot of projects that we over estimated the impact of COVID and supply chain, and we were very happy when we opened we opened our bids and they were, I think almost all of our projects were either right on or slightly under bid budget during COVID. Um, Kevin, we have a question from Bob oh, over here. Sure. Hi. Yes. Um, more of a statement, but thank you. So my name is Barbara LaRue. I'm the current chair of the planning board. I'm going to try during all of these meetings to be really clear about when I'm speaking as myself and when I'm speaking on behalf of the board. So right now I'm speaking on behalf of the board. After our last meeting, I did go back and share with the planning board an update on what was discussed here. And I will continue to do that throughout this process. And therefore I have to share back what was discussed. And there were two things that I think um, that my board would like me to convey. The first is just um, 
the board's very strong feeling that the planning department as a whole should have been involved earlier in this process before the feasibility study um, happened because the scope of the feasibility study was exceptionally narrow and I don't think that it did the town good service because um, any one of us here in this room and anyone on the planning board or staff could have told all of us um, that the other two sites you considered were not appropriate everyone knew that from the beginning so we really only considered one site and and I do think that was short-sighted um, I think probably we're too far down the road to do anything about that but I think it's important that it is conveyed and kept in mind for any future projects and I also wanted to mention that planning board has and staff have mentioned to town administration that we think it's extremely important that the town embark upon a study of all the available community property um, what the town owns and what they have access to so that in the future we actually have a better idea when projects like this come forward as to what land is available and what is appropriate and what should be considered because this feasibility study it wasn't really a feasibility study it was just a study of how we're going to do it on this piece of property that having been said this piece of property is very well positioned for a police station and we all agree that's a, a great place for it but it, it wasn't handled the way it should have been the other thing that I wanted to convey as a representative of my board is that there are people in town people and groups in town that feel very strongly about saving the Union School or perhaps just saving the facade of the Union School to preserve some part of its history um, I personally am not taking that on but I believe there will be people in town that will want to work with you about mm -hmm. options about how that could be preserved in some state or another and I, I wanted you to just be aware that that's probably going to come up and to that end I think it is important for this committee or administration I'm not sure who is appropriate to do that to make sure that this information is available to the public because it would be so much better to get their input early on than mm -hmm. after when it's too late yep. um, so I just wanted to make sure that you all knew that that has not that concern is still um, very apparent and I think you said you haven't talked yet to the Historical Commission I think mm -hmm. it's time oh. to do that yes and also the community at large is going to have an opinion about this and we should get that opinion now not later yeah, yeah. Okay. I hope that you I hope nobody at this in this group or that's listening thinks that we've got anything etched in stone at this point I right understand. Now, right now, it's this is very, very, very high level conceptual. With right. But the, the information people that's in given. this room know what's happening. The general public doesn't. Correct. And so, we're moving down this path, and we don't want to go too far down this path without involving the public at least in some of these discussions or informing, like, perhaps. And and we can do that through through the media and, and other outlets, but we need to make sure we're reaching out to the community so they don't find out about it after we have gone too far yes. to to include their input. Yeah, transparency is, is extremely important to make sure that everybody involved knows exactly the steps we've taken. We've checked all the boxes that we've gone obviously through the planning board, we've gone through historic, we've gone through all of the site permitting issues that there may be. Um, no, but what they we've need done, to know about it before you do that. Yeah. is my point and then also to Mr. Sefardini's point um, that you had talked about a little bit about the water table and about drainage and things like that this will be going through the normal planning board site pro plan process which is very rigorous and so I would encourage all of you to participate in that and, and so all of those things will be addressed so don't worry about that the interior of the building we don't get as involved in I would just point out, Chief and I have spoken to the Historical Commission months ago, so we yeah. started the conversation. Yeah. But, um, I guess the only other thing that I might add is that at the feasibility stage, we identify where the item, where the issues are going to be. We don't necessarily get to the point of solving it because we don't really have a project yet. Um, we do try to identify all of the permitting issues that is, that is going to come up and try and put a 
path forward if it, the project does move forward beyond the feasibility stage we become a real project that we have a, a road map going forward that we know that we've got to go to planning we know we've got wetlands we've got all of those steps that we've identified during the study that we're not just glossing over and going 100 miles an hour and say this is what we're going to do and then we're going to try and force our way that's not the way we're working we're trying to be inclusive we need we need full community buy-in so what we've done to date is kind of try to get something that we can bring to you folks as a committee it's now start to hear some of the, the the concerns and the issues that might be coming up from your constituency out there in the general public on what's going to what really is important for the town of Burlington so that this project meets all of their expectations and, um, and the other thing you mentioned you know the the process itself is actually quite extensive because if we move forward with this plan which I think we probably are going to that does require as you know a zoning change yep. so it has to go to town meeting so that's actually a very extensive planning process that we have to go through yep. so I know that um, administration is working with the planning director um, but we just need to make sure that you're aware that yes. there's there are a lot of it's written into the bylaw it's a very extensive process that has to yes. be followed my, okay. my landscape architect when he did is um, <clears throat> We started to do kind of the, the high level review of the, the sites that we were told were potentials for, for use. You get into your zoning and your planning guides and all of those regulations and bylaws so that as we started to put, we've been a little hesitant to start distributing too much too widely until this committee was formed mm -hmm. so that you people are the first to hear about it and then it can be disseminated that way. So we've been trying to get kind of our hands on just how big is the building got to be. Mm -hmm. can it fit here mm -hmm. and right now in my mind I don't have a, there's not a single piece of line work that can't be modified to reflect what the desires of the entire community are okay. um, so I don't I, I don't personally think that we've gone too far or a point where we can't turn around where I don't think you have either yeah. I just want to make sure that we in this room don't continue down a path not not purposefully but unintentionally leaving the larger community out yeah no, it was something that I talked a lot about with the chief on how do we start to bring the public in? How do we how do we become transparent? Is there a website? Is there something other informational meetings? Are the community? Are, do you have an open house and you have us there to talk with the department about how we want what we're thinking of doing? All of those types of marketing marketing issues to make sure that the general public has the right information. Right, and I would I would think we should take advantage of some of the events that already occur in town to um, disseminate that information. I know these things are a little further away, but when the weather gets nicer, we should be attending events that are already happening in town that people are used to, like the 4th of July celebration and like Celebrate Burlington yep. with pictures and boards and, and everything so that people are not surprised. Or, or going off of hearsay. That's that right. Is, that is not well informed. Yes. Mm -hmm. now, we don't typically get into the you should vote for this we just present the information I so that, that if you're transparent and you've done everything you're supposed to you share all the information there's no it, it, you're never going to get rid of the hearsay there's the people that are going to be against it for whatever reason no matter how much you prove that this is the absolute right way to go you're mm -hmm. never going to change their mind but at least they will make their their decisions based on proper and correct information correct from so cost to size to Right. Now, my understanding is that the hope is to bring the zoning change in May? Yes. Do you intend to do an update in January at town meeting? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. That was part of the, that was part of the reason why I wanted to get together to try and hear what might need, might need to be needed for the January information briefing so that we can have as much time to prepare that documentation for you folks to present at town meeting or if you want me to be there as well. Um, we usually find that it's best if it's presented by the town to the town they a lot of times they don't like to hear from us because of course you're the hired gun you're going to tell them you're going to tell us what the department wants it's different hearing it from your own community that this is you've vetted it you've been through all the, the process and here's where we're at and this is what we're recommending um, but we're obviously there to support you in every in every step of the way Okay, thank you. Kathy, uh, I know we want to try to keep these to an hour. I know that Kevin and we're happy to stay as long as uh, people want to stay, but I know uh, folks got to go to work and things of that nature. So, Kathy, you want to? Kathy Byer, uh, Zoning Bylaw Review Committee, and also a town meeting member. And I will say that you, you commented about the water table, and 
in touring the police station, aside from the fact that it was never really set up to operate well as a police station, mm -hmm. which we would like to see uh, for Burlington, uh, the biggest disappointment was looking at the basement and that part of the building that was built in 1992, mm -hmm. which has all kinds of water problems and groundwater issues. And so I have a huge concern about what will happen as far as mitigation goes, because that was only done 30 years ago. Yeah. And so that is a large concern. And I anticipate that whoever does the presentation at January town meeting, aside from the other mm -hmm. two places with wetlands issues, uh, I expect that there may be a question about whether or not any other properties were looked at, whether or not there is a better location that the town should purchase. And I would, would like to see that addressed. But biggest concern, water table mm -hmm. on the property that has already caused recent problems. Yep. So, okay. Yep, we will obviously address when we, when we get, we'll need to do some, like I said, some preliminary uh, geotechnical information surveys of what the materials are, where, the, where we do some borings and test pits to see what's there. Um, that will help us to not only influence what we actually, how deep we can go in the building, how deep we may want to go with a foundation, with a basement, but it will also help us to understand what we might need to do from a civil engineering standpoint, from a wastewater uh, mitigation, if the, what, the, what, what kind of mitigation and what scale we need to do, um, and what kind of foundations we need to put in. Are we, is the soil so bad that we need to put piles? Can we just do conventional spread footings? Do we need to do grade beams and, and that sort of thing with a structural slab? We don't know because we, don't have this, we haven't gotten to that point in the, in the process yet. <clears throat> I, I was sort of also looking at the facilities uh, study that Barbara had mentioned and whether or not they're out of the other two places, which planning would have told you wasn't appropriate, whether or not other avenues were pursued. And that predates my participation in the committee. So I'll just say it again. Uh, the select board and the police administration's preferred site was to, to, to build, rebuild the police station on the existing site. So I, I understand the location and the reasons for wanting that so thank you what I don't understand is why we spent money on a feasibility study though when everybody knew that the other two sites were not appropriate that's not something we need to discuss now but I wouldn't say that at all Barbara I think that and I'll speak for myself I thought that the Vinebrook treatment plant was a very good uh, location uh, for a police it's station zone. it it wasn't as of a few years ago so I live on the other side of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, not, gonna dispute, I'm not gonna dispute that. I'm just saying that uh, to yeah. say that um, the sites weren't viable, they're absolutely uh, both viable sites for something uh, town related. For um, something not town without related, issues. Yes. Not without for issues. Not station, without no. other issues. Yeah. Uh, I believe, I agree with you, something town related could go on, on those sites, not a police station. But if, if there okay. are. Just to make it clear, we, are, we desired to replace the police station where it is. Uh, once Kevin and his crew um, determined that we could fit a police station on that site, again, albeit with uh, use of a portion of the sculpture box site, then we chose not to look much further than that because that was what our goal was uh, from the start, so. And if, it does, if, if you do find out that there is another site that you want us to review, it's not it, it's all part of our review process we don't say we're only going to review two or three sites I was involved in a study over in uh, back a bunch of years ago in Holden Mass where we evaluated 27 sites the site selection pro they have a lot of wetlands and a lot of that that we did a lot of some of them were immediately kind of at a very high level reviewed and not ex not really optional but then then it kind of whittled itself down to the ones that seemed to be viable but Right now, we haven't. If there's another site, two, three, four that come up that, from this group that we need to evaluate, we'll absolutely do our due diligence and make sure that we've taken a look at those and held them up against what kind of what the established goal was to keep where it is. If, there's, if there is a better site and it proves out that it's a better site, then I think that's the pro that's what the process is going to show us. 
that what is the proper site, what is the proper size building, where should it be? I, I was under the impression that process had been completed, and I, I would like to know from administration if that's the fact, because I didn't think that was the the, pro, the, um, the purpose of this. I would tell committee. you from the select board administration position, the site's been selected. That's what I thought. So Thank I don't you. want to waste time looking at other sites if, if that's, you know, if this is where it's going to be, then fine. My, my point, <laughs> I would like to say my point was that expect the question to come up. Absolutely. And I yes. do think that it's very nice to have police, fire, and town government all located uh, where they can work more closely together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the disadvantages might be, but uh, I, I did understand why they would want to retain that position in the town center. So I'm not against that. I'm just worried about the water. <laughs> That's a uh, Yes. Does Kevin have any more of his presentation? And it'll leave all the questions at the end because we have run out of time. I think I was, if it, I, all I've got is some schematic, some just organization, how we started conceptually to lay the plans out, but that's just no, kind of. Can, can, can you share these things? These. Yeah, I, we've just, we've wanted this group to get together before things were made public or quasi public. Um, the, you folks had a chance to be the first ones to see it before it gets out to the general public, not that we're trying to hide anything or, or any of that, but. Yeah. It was hard to see, to be yes. honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to add to the group, in your presentation to the group? I don't think so. I think that we're just, we're here. We're, our, our goal is to listen to what you guys want to do and make it, and add our expertise so that the building fits not only the use and, and functionality for the department, but it needs to fit into the context of the, of the, munis of the town of Burlington. Um, Do you have preliminary architectural drawings or anything like that? I have some conceptual massing and I can draw. No, I'm not asking you to do that now. I oh. just, you know. Yes, uh, I do have it now, but <laughs> if uh, you want to. Maybe at our next just meeting. Just a minute yeah. or two. Okay, thank well, you. Well, the, the, uh, when you consider the locations, are all of the properties town owned that were considered? Yes. No consideration of going out and buying a parcel, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Um, Mr. McDiff, we'll take you uh, once every, the committee members are... Oh, I don't. Take I, questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm waiting. Thanks. I saw you were heading out. And I suspect that once you, further down the road, when you get a better idea and a handle on the schematic and the layout and the blueprints, uh, it might be possible to say that you've built a building similar to that in another community mm -hmm. that possibly board members and other individuals could go visit, yep. particularly the police personnel, to go through the building to see if it meets their needs before you move any further on that, on that yeah. design. I've actually talked with the chief a little bit about it. He, um, <coughs> as part of his due diligence before we were hired, he spoke with um, Chief Kennedy out in Lemonster. That's where I was just coming from. We just finishing up their new station. They're slightly, probably 2,000 square feet bigger than what we're planning here, but it would give a, a, and Chief Kennedy was more than, I was just talking to him this morning, more than happy to bring whoever from this committee wants to take a tour to see the kind of spaces that we're talking about, get an idea of the, con the, the conceptual size, the finishes, the orientation, the organization within the building, um, so people can start to see what a, what a modern day <coughs> locker room, what a modern day um, roll call room, training room, detention area. Um, the other thing I can't show you there is dispatch because their dispatch is handled remote. But absolutely, the, the desire of the community is to go view some other projects to get an idea of what we're looking to do. We have a number of stations in the area. I'd only caution about, you know, downsizing what you've initially started out with the projection of 35,000 square feet because, uh, you know, my experience is led me to see and believe that, you know, when you do that, all of a sudden you say, oh, I wish I had another 2,000 square feet or, or whatever. So I'd be cautious about well, what I was smaller yeah. and bigger. What I was, I guess what I should clarify that a little bit was that right now we have a, a multiplier of 33 or 35% on our net to gross. Depending on how efficient we are, that's where the square footage comes out of, not out of the program space. If he says that if we found out that we needed for the administrative, we need 
three thousand square feet for the entire administration space that's not going to change it's the square footage that gets us corridors walls um, elevators right. stairs those types of things if we can get those to be more efficient we don't need the bigger square footage but it's not compromising the program the size that the, the department sees that they need for real operations so it's kind of that I don't want to say fluff number but that things don't actually get assigned to anything that the building needs ducts chases and those types of things that don't show up on any square footage that comes out of that 35 percent net to gross scaling factor but I'm not going to be changing the size of any of the, the detention area the patrol the blockers any of that stuff those are things that we don't those just don't change unless there's a mission critical thing that needs to change that we that the department comes to us that we need to re-examine re this because now there's some other type of policing that needs to be done that we hadn't thought of then that needs to be put in as a real placeholder for square footage Good. Good. question on that that same thought Kevin is is it a practice you've seen at all to to have a, a second station in one town so a substation substation so you're you're trying to plan for the future and you're tr you know trying to be mindful of price and space we can build things and to, in my mind it's like that's a that's a risk because you don't know what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years but mm -hmm. do do some places say okay we're going to open up another spot in town i don't know that i've ever seen that okay. other than maybe a community outreach where they take a little storefront in a bigger municipality where you might have something like that but an actual another station i don't i don't know that i've ever seen that um i've seen you see that more on the fire side right because they're looking to spread out their app their assets to proper get proper coverage the pd they're on a cruiser they with they're they're constantly going around town so having one point for the public to come and have an interface versus two I don't know that I've ever seen that in any other municipality and yeah it's kind of a different usage I guess than, than yeah fire. okay any other questions uh, from the committee one about that I don't remember that being part of the we we did not speak of that specifically however when we did the public record storage in our current mezzanine that that is included in that room right now so we so it would have been range. included everything that's there would be going to the new one so it's in essence it's been included because that was that's the biggest thing and to, to allude to his point that the worst thing that can happen is the day you open you say I don't have enough storage <laughs> and when we went through and did all of our programming we made sure that we put storage in each one of the each one of the departments so that we had kind of central storage and then each individual bureau whether it be detectives or traffic or patrol or whoever they have storage within their 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 suite if you will so that the that we're trying to build these pieces in and we try not to let that disappear as we start to have budget constraints and start to have to squeeze and push um, but we try we've, we've, we've added in storage for as much as we can foresee that they're going to need any other questions Mr. McNiff. thank you hi i'm uh, james mcniff i live at 59 villagewood drive in burlington um i guess one of the first things you started with which maybe i can help because i've done a lot of research over the last week or two because i have the time and I also love to do research, so I've been digging, um, that as far as uh, taking other police stations, I've done about seven where I've analyzed them. And one in particular Keith worked at, uh, Leo, uh, Leo Minster? Leminster. Leminster, that's yes. it. I'm from New York, so excuse me. <laughs> Leminster. He did an incredible, you did an incredible job there. Thank you. You, um, I read all the reports and all the, uh, from the square footage and the process because you had on your site every meeting every note every step that was taken and from what I can gather you were a key person yourself in the decisions that were made yes, as I was, was project, I was a project manager manager right and just to give a sense to people so to get a feel for it the town started with 45 
uh, I think it was 45 million and, and a 10, 10 million with satellite. That was 55 million. By the time they finished, and you actually put the question right, and you've said it through this whole meeting, which I appreciate, is you said there's a difference between wanting something and needing something. And you were able to bring that down where when you were finished, I've seen the articles from the police department raving about how they love their police department. So I think you're the right person to do this from my own observation. It's a personal. Didn't he didn't pay me. <laughs> he didn't pay me, but the similarity between the one Leminster and uh, Burlington are very common because it's about the same number of police, sworn police officers. So I found, and when you brought up about 35,000 square feet, originally I thought, based on an amount that was given at the last meeting of getting a um, $47 million debt exclusion, I was expecting square footage probably in the range of 47,000 square feet because I've computed, I think it runs around $950 a square foot from the average that I've seen of the ones I've done. And so I'm able to work backwards and figure out what the square foot is. So um, I think you're a good selection. I don't know if they're going to, you had a project leader during that, at that site, who did all the notes, did all the taken, was it, uh, is, I don't know if Burlington's considered to have a project manager. That was Dalla. Um, Daedalus? Yeah, Daedalus. Daedalus. They were, the, they were the owner's project manager. At the feasibility study, uh, municipalities are not required to have an, on, an owner's project manager. Okay, so. If, this, if we are talking about going to town meeting in May, before you can hire us for the next step, you would have to hire an owner's project manager. The, okay. the OPM, once, the, once it becomes a project over, is it over $100,000? Do you have to have an OPM? I forget what the thresholds are for, for some of the things, but... Um, Typically, the, the clerk of the works. Correct. The clerk of the works would typically work for your OPM. Yeah, um, so, so a question I really have right now is to the town, because I I feel that the thirty-five thousand to thirty thousand, I'm more in the line of what you need versus what you want. And I understand this, the point about having everything you can, but when you get down to the budget, and when I heard forty-seven million dollars, and then I. I kind of computed 30,000 square feet. I go, the price doesn't seem right. It seems that it's like almost maybe, in that case, it would be $15 million close to overpriced if, if it's $47 million that I heard. So that was really my question to the town. The difference between the square footage that, let's say it is 30 to 35, and having a $47 million price tag. I well, there's a delicate balance that takes place in building a project, and the the only the only concern that I that I as an individual has, uh, and this goes from having been involved in construction of school projects, mm -hmm. is that um, you know for an extra million, I'm just throwing this figure out. It's not particularly uh, uh, focusing on this project, but but when I talk about space, making sure you have what you need to operate your facility and also look down the road, have some vision in terms of how this department's gonna evolve over the next generation. And while you're doing the project now, it's gonna be a lot cheaper, even if it costs you a million dollars more, or even two million dollars more. I'm obviously 10 million, when you start getting in big figures, then, then all of a sudden the tax rate and what you're gonna bond gets out of, out of control. But within reason, instead of looking at it from the perspective of how can we downsize and i think that's a dangerous concept because then everybody starts thinking what can we cut i'd rather I, as as an individual i'd rather say let's not look at that let's look at what the department needs and and i'm not going to be one and and i doubt any individual around, around the table is going to dictate that other than the police personnel because they go in the work every single day and they know the issues that they're faced with every single day. We have a concept of what the police department does, but they actually do it, and they know what they need for space, uh, you know, ranging from having a secretary that's basically operating out of the hallway and have, rather than having a, a, a complex set up so that they can operate, storing records, 
and facilities that are designed for, for record storage, all of these kinds of things. There's a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. that, that needs to be done. So I would just caution, you know, when we go down that road of coming up with the plan, and I think you've done a great job in terms of analyzing the data, uh, look at, is it going to meet our needs? And if Lemonster has a facility, as you're pointing out, I think it would be really important for some of our personnel to go out there and see it, take a look at it, because I've, I've been through that myself. And when you go out to the, to the facility, you take a look, you say, oh, that's great, or that may not work. And as Lemonster, by the way, we've got 70, 68 personnel in that building. 68 sworn. Is, is, that, is that pretty much the size yeah, of 70, Lemonster? They have 71 sworn officers. 71. Okay, so 71. All right, so yeah. that's in the range. It's a, a, a 45,000 45, people in the population of the town. Well, but during the day, what does the population go to? The, well, ours is 125,000, and, you see, and they disappear, see, that's right? You, <laughs> that's what you have to take into consideration yeah. in Burlington. We have a 30,000 population oh, yeah. in this mm -hmm. town. I mean, when I moved in in 1972, you know, the population was probably 21,000, 22,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. But today, and who would have thought it would have projected the way it has, particularly with the population during the day, you have well over 100,000 people coming in. Lemonster doesn't even come close to that mm -hmm. during the day. So I think we have to also take that into consideration. What these gentlemen and, and the staff in that department are dealing with on a daily basis. Give them what they need because in the long run, it's going to be so much better. We won't be going back and saying, oh, I wish I had another this. I wish I had that bigger. I, I just think that these folks have to be the ones that are going to make the determination. With respect, I don't think that's what Mr. McNiff yeah, was probably. asking, though. And I think what he's asking is important because it's going to come up at town meeting. If, I'm assuming that these numbers are correct, if roughly police stations cost about $1,000 per square foot, I think your question is, why aren't we getting about 47 Hundred square feet, not I mean, forty in, as opposed to thirty-five hundred million. You, you mean in, in the so, cost? No, if we're spending forty-seven the, seven million, million versus why aren't we getting yeah, more square footage? Using and that I, town, I know there's a reason for that. I that's just my don't question. Know what it is, and I think that question may very well come up at town meeting. That, and that sure happens in every community. That's right. that's a very valid. I understand point. that, but I'm I think the question no, is but, more for town administration to explain, be ready to explain to town meeting why we are paying more than a thousand dollars per square foot, um, per, no, per square foot. You're, you're right. talking about a thousand per square foot. Yeah, right now, yeah, I did the and average of six towns an answer for right, that now. right now, but it's a very important question that will be come up at town meeting. So I think the only time we talked about price is somewhere or our feet to the fire, and we said it's way too early because we don't have anything oh, okay. yet. We said it could be <laughs> so between 40 estimate. and 45 okay. million okay. back of the envelope. All right. That, none of that has okay. been figured out yet. Okay. Okay. But they're going to be, they know you're watching, so you're, <laughs> I know. You're, well, you're on my team. Well, you I, 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 <laughs> Well, I'll be on uh, Keith's team. I, I trust that based on what I've seen, the, work, the result he's had, I think you've picked a good. But your the argument really that. wasn't so much how can we reduce. You were saying let's oh, make sure we're getting well, all the square footage we need for the money we're spending. Right. If you went to that police department today and you went to visit and you were to talk to their police officers and they tell you this is what, it, you know, number of people, everything is set up and this is, we, did, we wanted this, but we kind of, maybe they didn't compromise. I'm not sure of all things they went through, especially when you started at 45,000 and 10, 55,000, you worked your way to 30. That's a big jump in the number of square feet. But they're satisfied that that met the needs of that town. Now, all I'm saying is, if that is and that's the cost, and I know what the cost was, it's not 47, not 45. It's a little less than that. That was my point. Well, I'll just uh, strike the balance between the two and say okay. our goal is to build a facility, facility. that will serve the town for the next 50 years. But it. like everything we do, we um, are try to be as utmost respectful to the taxpayers because uh, that's the, the final say that's, around that's here. what I'm here for <laughs> that's how we do everything and uh, that's what the goal will be on this project uh, we don't want to I agree we don't want to um, not build the police station that's going to keep us for the next 50 years we don't want to cut corners on it we want to do it right I uh, want to do it right the first time but in, in as in all of our decisions as a town uh, we always want to be respectful to the taxpayers and I think this this project will be no different uh, in, in that regard so well, could you introduce the new person? 
person at the table for us? I'm sorry, guys. Uh, this is Kate Fazio uh, from the police department. Uh, she's going to help keep us organized, uh, take care of our minutes, set up our meetings and whatnot. So sorry about that. Thanks, thanks for them. <laughs> but again, happy holidays to everybody. Appreciate uh, everybody coming out on this very busy week. And uh, we'll be in touch about the next meeting. Thank you very much. Happy holidays to you.